What's up, y'all, and welcome into the Jack Vita Show. I'm your host, Jack Vita, back here in action on the first day of September 2022. August went by very quickly. Uh, we're talking at 11 a.m. today. It's a Thursday. We got about five weeks left the regular season, and we have a fantastic <coughs> guest joining us today to talk plenty of baseball. Uh, he was the general manager of the Colorado Rockies, 1999 2014 were those the years uh and in 99 very very 99, like, yeah. near the end of the 99 season through 14 great about 15 seasons 15 15 seasons and now he's over at mlb network uh he's been around the game quite a bit he's done a lot with recently with scouting some of the prospects and the draft guys the college kids the high school kids he's also got a son who's in college baseball right now uh, but we would like to welcome him here for the first time, Dan O'Dowd. Dan, it is so great to have you here. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. So I tried an, quite an introduction. Hopefully I can live up to it here on this, your <laughs> podcast. You've had a lot of great people on it, so I'm honored to be on it. Oh, thanks. Well, uh, you are up there with the greats now. <laughs> we'll see. I haven't said a word yet. You'll have to make that decision when we're done. <laughs> okay, so... I got a couple of questions for you as a general manager. The first thing I want to know, as someone who spent 15 years, 99 through 2014, and then before that, several years as the assistant GM with the Cleveland Indians, my question is, what do you think of the movie Moneyball? I mean, I think it started the whole uh, analytical revolution to some degree, even though I think a lot of it was going on prior to that. I think it was all bubbling you know, beneath the surface. Um, I mean, I thought it was good. I thought it was fictional. A lot of it was not even close to the truth from my perspective. I mean, I was somewhat intricately uh, connected to it that most people don't know is that when I left the Indians in um, 98, uh, I talked to Billy about coming to Oakland with him. It just didn't work out for my wife and I to be able to pursue that. Billy had turned, you know, Billy at that time still is a really dear friend of mine. And someone I have just a great deal of respect for. Uh, anyway, I was the one who introduced him to Paul D. Bedesto. <laughs> so that whole scene of how he met Paul, and that was totally fictional in <laughs> complete regard. But, you know, a new way of looking at the game. Um, I thought it was, you know, I thought Billy was on the forefront of bringing that to the, um, you know, below the surface to the surface within our game. So that part of it, I think, was real. I think all the, the trading and all of that around it was it was fictional though it's not really the way it plays out but it was great it was a great movie and it was a great book too michael lewis wrote a great book michael lewis is a great author yeah i've read the book the book is a true story essentially yep. and then or it is a true story and the movie they have to make a cinematography whatever the right word is there they have to turn it into a movie and have a hollywood film and it's a great movie but i mean there's no talk about their amazing pitching rotation that they had that year. They had the Cy Young yeah, they just, yeah. and yeah, the they MVP just isolated on that team. One part, yeah, they just wanted to isolate one part of the club um, because it tied into the whole theme of the movie. You I know, mean, I got it. It was great. But you're right. They had Hudson, Zito, Mulder. They had the hot edge shortstop. I mean, they had a, you know, they had a great team. And, you know, Heidelberg was a really good player that, you know, turned into the star of the movie. But there were certainly, <laughs> you know, some really great aircraft carriers on that team. And you're telling me that GMs don't fly into a city just to talk about a trade for like a no. couple hours? <laughs> no, that doesn't work. I'm not even sure GMs in today's game even get on the phone to talk about trades. I think they do more texting um, and social media, you know, reaching out Slack and everything else rather than live phone calls. So they certainly aren't getting on a plane to be able to do that. <laughs> and... The thing that I was also thinking from what I've read about Billy Bean when I've seen him talk, uh, the Brad Pitt character doesn't seem like Billy Bean. He seems like a more humble guy than in the movie. Yeah, Billy's a really humble guy. I mean, if, you know, you met Billy in a social setting and didn't know who he was. In the course of that conversation, you would never know who he was. I mean, he's just a – his Tara's a great wife. He's got a great family. He's a really – down-to-earth human being with great values uh he's really smart um but he doesn't act really smart and uh you know he's just a really good person so i mean i have a lot of respect for him well let's uh i want to mention while we're talking about baseball movies 
you're also connected to my other favorite baseball movie in a weird way, Major League. Yeah, you were one, with two. the you were with the Indians at the time, right? When they released when Major that premiered. League? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What that was that was, experience that was like? Uh, you know, there was some, there might have been more realism in that movie than Moneyball <laughs> to some degree. Uh, that was really cool. You know, we got to see the premiere of the, of the movie and it was hilarious. You know, we had gone through a similar kind of renaissance in Cleveland ourselves. So I thought, you know, we had some interesting characters on those teams too. Very similar to the interesting character they had in the, in the movies. We didn't necessarily have, you know, wild thing in the back end of our bullpen, but <laughs> You know, we had some guys, you know, Serranos and some of those guys that were floating around our rosters. So, I mean, we love the movie and I love I love the city of Cleveland. So I love the fact that it started to put Cleveland in some way, shape or form into the discussion um, about the game of baseball, because, you know, our renaissance in the 90s was phenomenal. And uh, I'm, I'm, the movie bought even more attention to it. Well, you mentioned Wild Thing. It took about 30 years, but Wild Thing has finally arrived as a member of the Guardians. You know what I'm talking about. He has, about. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that he is wild, though. He's just uh, – he's got – you know, I think he's the best closer in the game. I mean, Diaz and him, you can make it. Oh, I was talking about – uh, I was talking about Karinchek. Karinchek's got oh, the yeah, Wild Thing. Might be the he best. wears 99. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I think of closer, I think of Classe. Um, Yeah, Karinchek's very similar to the Wild Thing. Yeah. You know, big top to bottom breaking ball, kind of can lose the strike zone a little bit, kind of walks into the game the same way. That's a good call, Jack. That's good. Yeah, number He's, 99. I forgot that. I went to a game last year when they were still the Indians, and they played Wild Thing. That's his runout song. So he comes out to Wild Thing, and he wears 99. And he, it's not – with Karen Check. I don't think it's like he's doing a shtick or anything. Like, that is who he is. He, he is Wild Thing. <laughs> yeah, he is. And – uh I still call them the Indians, by the way. I, I'll never get over that. Uh, I'm still, I just, they're still the Indians to me. So sorry, I was getting hot sitting in the young seat. <laughs> That's cool. Where are you right now, Dan? My backyard. I uh, live in Nashville, just sitting in the backyard. I want to get out of my home office to do this and get out. It's a beautiful day here. The oh. weather in Nashville right now is spectacular. So I'm trying to enjoy every minute of it. Yeah, and we've had some good weather here in Chicago, too. It's been, you know, I was just in Chicago. Uh, I told you I visited my daughter. No, you didn't just, tell me that. Yeah, she just moved her and her husband. Her husband just took a job in downtown Chicago. Oh, they sweet. moved about six weeks ago to uh, Lincoln Park. And so we flew in uh, over the weekend to see their condo that they bought and, you know, just check in on her, make sure everything was okay. So, and we've got great weather in Chicago, it was spectacular while we were there. Absolutely. So the Indians, you guys did this spectacular documentary a few years ago on MLB Network Presents, which they do a great job with those documentaries. I think oh, they those do. Are... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they're tremendous, Jack. They're, they're such talented people that run that department for the network. I think it's better than 30 for 30, in my opinion. Yeah, they're good, too. But I, I do think the attention to detail in our documentaries, our documentaries, it's not my documentary, but the network's <laughs> documentaries, I think, are fantastic. Um, so they did this great documentary on, it was the dynasty that almost was, I think was the title. It was about your Indians teams from back then. Um, and they did a great job with it. And they compared, you mentioned how some of those players were a little like the major league characters. There was a comparison in that documentary of Albert Bell to one Pedro Serrano. Yeah. Yeah. Albert talked to his bats. Uh, Albert <laughs> took spe specific care. Of his bats. Uh, yeah, Serrano might have been a little calmer than Albert, but maybe not because below the surface, Serrano had a, a simmering temper too. Albert yeah. was an incredibly talented player, Jack. And, you know, he was probably the most challenging um, development opportunity I've ever had in my career. I didn't draft Albert. Albert was there when I, uh, when I got to Cleveland, when Hank Peters brought me over to run their, their player development area. But Albert was part of the system and he challenged me every step of the way. Made me better in the long run, but in the short term, oh boy, he was a challenge to say the least uh, because he was so sure of his ability and he was so sure of the player development path he should have been on versus the player development path I was outlining for him. So <laughs> I got really, we could do a whole podcast just on Albert Bell stories. Uh, but oh what a, what an incredibly talented young man. He is, uh, if he didn't really hurt the hip, I. I feel Albert would have – I'm not sure it was a first ballot Hall of Famer because of the defense, but I do think he was a Hall of Fame talent, and I think he eventually got in because his numbers would have been overwhelming. 
So another question I have for you, Dan, is as someone who's been in these front offices with a couple of different teams, do you have a single season or maybe a couple of seasons that were the most fun of your career, the most meaningful to you? Yeah, I would say, Jack, I think, uh, I mean, any time that you win is always enjoyable. Um, the first time, you know, we won in Cleveland in 95, that was incredibly rewarding because when I got there in 88, I mean, we were really bad. <laughs> and uh, then we had an incredibly terrible tragedy in spring training. Um, two years prior to that, where we lost uh, our young closer, Stevie Olin, and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, another pitcher on our team that I'm drawing a brain cramp on now. And, but it was, uh, and Bobby Ojeda was in the accident too, and we had just signed him as a free agent. And it really rocked our organization to its core, right when we, you know, we felt like we were beginning to get some momentum. And, um, so when we, I think, you know, honestly, in 94, we, I was at the club in Boston when the work stoppage hit, and we were rolling, and we were breathing down. The White Sox were really good back then, but we had closed the gap on them significantly, and we were breathing down their neck when the work stoppage hit. And I, you know, humbly, I'd like to think that we, we would have gotten in postseason in 94 because the young talent on that team started to really believe in itself. And then so to win in 95, you know, to come back and win 100 games and 144 game season, um, you know, I just felt like if, you know, if the strike zone in the 95 World Series is the strike zone today, you know, we have a chance to win that World Series. But, you know, it, Atlanta's pitching was so good and they took advantage of really wide strike zone the entire series. And, and they were good. I mean, it, it was an evenly matched series. And, you know, you can always say the better team wins. We didn't make the adjustments. But that was a really rewarding experience. And I'd say, um, you know, when I got to Colorado, um, there was a, I had outlined a vision, that vision changed based upon ownership. Um, and then when that didn't work, we got back to the original vision, which was develop a homegrown scouting development type organization. Don't try to rush the process, just let it happen organically take your lumps along the way, just develop a process that has a chance to turn into something successful. So to get to the to the postseason in 07 and to go on the kind of magical run that we had, uh, those two, I mean, obviously those two seasons stand out, not because we won, it's because it was a group of people that, because um, that's what all front office is, is a group of people unselfishly giving of themselves for the benefit of others and trying to all pull on the same end of the rope to recognize the dream and in those two cases you know we did and i was so happy for everybody that was involved uh in the process that had gone through all the lean times to get there one of your former players will transition a little bit into some newer stuff former player matt holiday entered into the st louis cardinals hall of fame over the weekend was he someone that I mean you you drafted him right you drafted no Matt no no Pat Pat Doherty drafted Matty Holiday um, so Bob Gebhardt and Pat Doherty were responsible for Matty being the organization when I got there Matty was in in Low A oh okay but he came up when you were there and you <laughs> had him and I'm I saw the moment on MLB Network during the draft where you talking with him after Jackson had gotten drafted when you had to make a when you had to trade him to the A's, was something was that difficult to have to do something? You know, like it that? wasn't Jack as as difficult um, as some other deals. Quite honestly, is because we had we thought we had signed Maddie prior to the two thousand and eight season. We had actually reached a, what I thought was an agreement uh, that his representative didn't think was an agreement, and uh, so. You know, we kind of went through a season of him being a lame duck. It, it really affected our whole 08 season. We had a World Series hangover. We didn't we didn't handle that really well. And then it was his situation. So, I mean, the reality was in, in the job that I had, I knew we weren't going to be able to keep him because he had turned down um, significant money. And it, it, that hurt um, because Maddie and Leslie were everything. You know, they were great Christian people. They embodied everything that we were trying to do with our organization. They stood for all the right things. 
in addition, he was a great player on the field that we thought was going to continue to just get better. So that part really hurt that we were losing somebody that was an integral part of our rebirth in Colorado. Um, and I knew replacing him was almost going to be impossible as relates to, you know, you, you, you know, if you're lucky, you might be able to replace the production and the talent, but the person and Les, I can't emphasize enough. His wife is just like an incredible human being and the kids you knew were just, just going to be raised in an awesome environment. So I'm not shocked about all the success of their children because it's such a great nuclear family. But, um, the trade itself, I mean, you know, as a GM, you do what you have to do. And in this case, we have, you know, we really didn't have a choice. And we were fortunate that Billy, again, you know, relationships in their game are paramount when you're making deals. And Billy and I had made a ton of deals prior to this. Uh, and I made some good deals. I just remind Billy, I made good deals for Billy because I got him Jermaine Dye one year for Nephew Perez because I couldn't financially hold on to Jermaine Dye. Um, so I made a good first half of the deal and a really bad second half of the deal and Billy benefited from that. And so he was very aggressive after Matt from day one. And when Billy's aggressive, you're going to get a deal done. And so we identified Carlos Gonzalez as a guy that we thought um, had really high upside that, you know, it stuttered up to that point just because of some broken development um, in his uh, overall process. And, you know, Houston street was a good add on for us as it relates to a closer. So the deal worked out great for us because Carlos, went off once we bought him up in 2009 and we got back into postseason. It's really interesting what you said about the relationships part of that with the general managers, because we do seem to see a lot of teams that tend to make deals with each other. Is it so there are certain guys that are easier to work with and there are probably other guys who eh, I don't want to get too close to that guy. Is it like that? Yeah, I don't know. You know, GM jobs are hard. Um, it's hard to make a trade. You know, everybody feels like this this fantasy baseball world we live in, this right. microwave society that we have. That, you know, you pick up a phone. But, you know, a GM is managing up, you know, as much as he manages down. So, you know, you're, you're trying to appease an ownership's vision of what they want the team to be. You're trying to not blow up your major league clubhouse to the degree that the manager has left trying to navigate through a mess you're trying to you know hold on to the you know the players you have in your system that you believe in i mean it's just a lot of different things so it's hard to make a deal so when i say all that it then becomes problematic if you don't have relationships on the other side of the phone or in this case the text uh, and i say that sarcastically um because you know you don't want to get far down the line with all the work involved with somebody that is not is being disingenuous to you um, as a part of making a deal. So there are GMs that you know in the game that, you know, I mean, obviously I haven't done the job in a long time now, but when I did it that you knew when they told you something, they already had approval from their owners for the most part. You know, ownership's always going to have to sign off at the very end. Uh, but there was credibility in what they said. And they, when they were GMs in the game, I would say they're they're out on a fishing expedition. <laughs> so they got their – they're fishing nets in the water and they're just trying to see what they can catch. They really aren't prepared to make a decision. They just, you know, they're kind of shopping their players and they're shopping your players to know who you move and who you don't move. And um, they're also in GMs, a game that that actually would shop and feel like they'd acquire one of your players and turn around and try to trade one of your players to somebody else before they even acquired your players. I try to really be cautious around those individuals. Um, because again, it just takes so I, I wasn't critical of what they were trying to do because everybody's, you know, everybody's rowing their own boat. And sometimes the, you know, the waves are really hard to row. I just realized that there were people in the game that, that were easier for me. If I liked their players, it was easier for me to go down that path because I knew I could get something done. So right now, that's really interesting, by the way, but right now there are a couple teams that it seems like they win a very high percentage of their trades. And the couple that come to mind are the Cleveland Guardians or Indians, as we like to say, and the Tampa Bay Rays, where they trade Blake Snell at a time where a lot of people are like, what are they doing? Why are they trading Blake Snell? And they seem to win so many of these trades. Were there any general managers when they called, you're like, that guy's so good. If he wants this player, am I looking at this player a little? Should I be looking at this guy a little differently because he values him more than I do? 
No, I think if you if that's your mindset, you're doing an awful job. <laughs> I feel like you got to know your own players better than you know other teams' players. And if you don't, you're probably not long for that job. Very, you're just not going to be very good at it. And so, no, no, I never felt that way. I, I felt like it was my responsibility to know my players better than the person on the other end of the line calling about my players. Uh, but I do feel like teams like um, Tampa and the Guardians, they do an exceptional job because they have very tight parameters that they exist in. Um, and I do think at times those tight parameters make you more proficient in the areas that you have to be proficient in because you don't fish in deeper waters. Whereas, you know, Brian Cashman or Andrew Friedman or the teams David Dombrowski ran, the bigger, larger market teams, you know, they fish in all depths of waters. Whereas the Rays and, and the Guardians, you know, they're confined to one area. So when they, they know they can't keep Frankie Lindor, the process starts in their mind of, um, okay, you know, who we're going to identify. And the Rays, you know, always look at try to trade their players at the peak of their value. But I do believe they're more successful, Jack, because they don't reach for younger players. If you look historically at the players that those two franchises bring back in trades, there are guys that are on the cups of being big league players or big league players that are very low, zero to one players in service time. Some cases, one to two, usually never beyond that. And so I feel like the industry misses more because they project on really, really young players uh, when they're making deals. And since the Indi since the Guardians, excuse me, I'm going to do that forever. <laughs> and the um, and Tampa Bay, they never are in rebuild modes. They're always in acquiring pro players to kind of redecorate their house. They're never going for the player that's an A ball, other than maybe it's an add on player in the deal. But the core pieces they're going to get back are guys that are almost close to the big league level, which I makes I think you could be more successful doing. That's a great model. Uh, hard on the fans. Because you know you you lack a true identity with star players, but it's a, probably the most efficient model in the game. And honestly, I think in Colorado, with all the obstacles that you face there, with the climactic environmental conditions, those models are the best ones to employ in, in those environments. But again, you got ownership has to be on board with that. Too. Cleveland seems to have, from my outside looking in perspective a relatively smart fan base that tends to understand, you know what, we might not be able to keep these guys forever. It seems like the fans remain pretty loyal when they trade a Lindor, when they trade whomever. Maybe my read is a little wrong, but I'm comparing that to yeah. a big market. Yeah, Yeah. see, here's where uh, I respectfully disagree. Okay. Um, is that, I mean, I do think fan bases – and, you know, base, I mean, basically your baseball club's an entertainment product. I mean, however you want to look at it, it's a form of entertainment to the market that you're in. A, a team that's successful is going to create um, a greater likelihood of a strong affinity towards your product. Um, a team that does that with players that have longstanding capabilities even makes it more attractive. And so when a Jim Tomey, Kenny Lofton, you know, uh, Omar Vizquel, um, if they spend Manny Ramirez, if they spend the majority time wearing your team's uniforms, there's a strong likelihood that you're going to draw well. So Cleveland has been incredibly successful on the field, but their attendance numbers are horrendous. I think they're 25th in the game this year in their home attendance. And so, you know, the correlation between the Rays, for an example, are averaging – I don't know. Next, they're near the bottom. Yeah, in attendance in the game. So, on-field product is tremendous, but there's there's been a real dichotomy for me. I can't wrap my arms around. Is that the correlation between on-field success and attendance numbers hasn't correlated in in either market? And and if I owned either of those teams, I'd be very concerned about that uh, in the big picture. I'm sure that's why. I think it's in Tampa. It's, we keep talking about the stadium. I agree yeah. with that completely. It's a difficult ballpark to get to going across the bridge. The ballpark yeah. itself doesn't lend itself to an enjoyable experience. And um, in the Guardians case, 
I, you know, I, I mean, I have such a strong affinity for that franchise because it's my greatest memories of my career happened there. But I always felt like um, as beautiful as Jacobs Field was, it's now progressive, that it was a market that really needed a dome stadium, retractable mm. dome stadium, because your 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 uh, shoulder months, your April and May are still really bad there weather-wise, as you know, living in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. And then when you go back to school in September, um, and then the weather starts to cool on you a little bit there, you just really need it. They, like they have the largest number of rainouts this, and they're playing more double headers than any team in the game this year. And so I don't know if that market can support that, but I do feel like it needs a new venue and that venue needs to be tied to retractable dome or the correlation between on-field success and, and the tenants revenue is never going to happen. So they're always going to then be that team in the lower quadrant of payroll and never be able to hold on to star quality players other than identifying like they did with Jose Ramirez, who just fall. He's the exception of the rule in our game. He's not like most players. Hope that makes sense to you. Oh, it totally makes sense. I guess what I was comparing it to was just my, it was more of a fan reaction. I think public fan reaction. If you look at social media, which is not a true reflection of reality, but I'm in here in Chicago and there's just so much like frustration and anger on the North side of Chicago towards the Cubs. But I think what the Cubs are doing in terms of trading all those guys and rebuilding and retooling their farm system, overhauling was the right move. And I think yep. a lot of people, a lot of fans don't really see that. And so my thought was, I thought that the smaller Guardians fan base has a better understanding of how that stuff works. I do. But I think if you ask the Guardian management team, they'll take the 37,000, the game that the Cubs have <laughs> right. consistently. Yeah. with their decision-making process in place rather than the, you know, the 12, 13,000, 14,000 <laughs> they're getting uh, per game to give more bandwidth to be able to make some financial decisions that maybe where they could fish in a deeper, deeper pond. But I mean, I agree with what the Cubs are doing completely too. I don't, they weren't, uh, they didn't have any choice because we've talked about this, Jack, is that, you know, the game revolves around your ability to have sustained uh, acquisition of talent. So it's always coming through the system. And so they may have not had to have a full teardown if they had been better at uh, acquiring talent. So they, they can pick and choose who they want to hold on to because you have young players coming through the system that say, okay, well, this is a first baseman, so now we can trade Anthony Rizzo or – this guy's a shortstop, so Horner's coming, so now we can let Baez walk because we have a as good a player, maybe a better player, making no money rather than somebody making money. But you need to have all that happening. And the Dodgers are, are proving that you don't have to have top 10 picks to do that each year. You can identify talent in a lot of different ways if you're proficient at development and um, sus still sustain success. Yeah, I'm really baffled by a lot of Chicago media and fans because – Last week, the Cubs won. A, it was like they – it was before the – card. it was actually after the Cardinals series. They lost the Cardinals series, and prior to that, they won their last six series. They're playing a lot of bad teams in that stretch, and all of a sudden, all these beat reporters are writing stuff about how this is like the Cubs of 2014 when they're right about to turn a corner, and I'm just not seeing that at all. I think their best – the future is in single A with – Pete Crow Armstrong and a number of the prospects they have are a long way off. They have some guys who are a little closer. I don't think this team is close. And so I was seeing all these articles written and these are beat reporters who are at the athletic, like very great outlets saying that, yeah, the Cubs could be a major player this winter. It makes sense for them to sign out, sign Aaron judge or one of these shortstops. I'm like, well, you have a really good shortstop in Nico Horner right now that you have under club control for four more years. And he's making the bare minimum right now. He's leading the National League in defensive runs saved. In addition to that, why would you sign an outfielder when your uh, the depth of your farm system is an outfield? You have a lot of good outfielders. So I actually wrote a piece last week. I titled it "Cub Your Enthusiasm." <laughs> Cute. I like that. Yeah, I'm really curious. You know, again, I just mentioned earlier in the podcast that I think you really need to scout your own internal organizations better than external. Um, I think the Cubs should wait a year um, 
because, you know, I think they had a setback with their center fielder who just coming back from the back injury now in AAA. I think they're, they really do have some really interesting pieces. Now saying that, I mean, I can see them maybe bringing back Contreras if they didn't feel like they had a young catcher in their system. Um, I mean, I can see them adding pieces. They, they feel like fit foundationally moving forward. Um, But I don't think you should go all in until you're, you've identified, like, I look at it, okay, when that Cub team won, they had uh, a young Contreras, they had aircraft carriers and Rizzo, Bryant, um, I think, you know, Schwaber, Baez. I mean, they they really had a good grouping. And they added Zobrist. I mean, they added some great complementary parts. But those guys were all there. So to me, when they need to add is when that next group is all there. Uh, kind of where the Orioles are at right now, and then, and then have the wherewithal to go say, okay, well, you know, our system couldn't produce X. We're going to go buy that, or we're going to trade our excess of X to go get Y. Right. Uh, but I don't think they're there yet. And I think when you try to rush the process, I'm going to move again, Jack. The sun's yep. trailing me. When you try <laughs> go to for it. when you try to rush the process is when, uh, you know, then, that's when it blows up on you. And I thought that's what happened with the Phillies and their rebuild. They didn't give J.P. Crawford a chance to settle in. They trade for – like, they felt the pressure in Philadelphia, wherever that came from, ownership, media, I don't know. Um, but they felt the pressure, Matt Clintac, the GM at the time. And all of a sudden, it was like, okay, we got to make things happen. we got to make things happen now. And I think it really it's – a, it's, a, it's, it's between an art and a science. So it's – I mean, your data has got to tell you one thing, and then your experience and wisdom has to tell you exactly when you need to do this. And then you have to resist the pressure – you're going to feel from the outside noise to do it prior to when it should be done. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think I do think the Cubs are a, a long, not a long way off, but I think they're at least a couple of years away. Maybe you get an interesting year next year. I just think you're looking at 2024 potentially. That's not, 20, yeah, that's not that. Yeah, long way off. You know, I, yeah. I always say that 2025 yeah, maybe. You, you know, the game is such a humbling game. You know, I've said this on air. Uh, the Clint Hurdle line or two people – types of people in the game, those are humble, those are about to be. And so I think timetables are for the foolish because you never know yeah. how close you are because you, you just each individual player's development is not linear. Some guys can just make these dramatic jumps in a short period of time. Other guys take a step back or two before they go forward. So you're really never close. You never know how you, close you are. So you just keep grinding your process. And then all of a sudden you wake up uh, and you're there. Like – the Royals, to me, have had a fascinating season of, 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 of both regression and progression. And, uh, but Dayton's such an experienced baseball guy with such a keen understanding and awareness of player development. He knows that for every step uh, Bobby Witt took back, he's now taking forward. That, you know, Lopez took some huge step back. Next year he could take these huge steps forward. Same with Prado, same with Massey, same with his collection of really good young players with all the young pitching. And so you just don't give up on it. And it gets back to your foundational understanding of what you believe in as a scout and an evaluator of talent. And then just holding true to the fact that that's eventually going to show. Is there a team, you mentioned that Cubs model in 2016, how they did it. What team or teams remind you of what like if you're buying stock in a team to do that kind of thing next year in the next couple of years? The Orioles. Yeah, um, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, uh, Toronto for me. Toronto for me had a really interesting season this year. It's it's easier to become competitive when there's no expectations on you. It's more challenging to stay competitive and win when the expectations now have grown. And the Blue Jays, for me, are a perfect example this year. They've kind of slid back a little bit because they're dealing with this weight of expectations they didn't deal with prior to that. The Orioles are going to have to go through that, too. And so I think the Blue Jays will make another step forward next year because I think they'll have a slower heartbeat um, learning how to deal with the pressure that accompanies that. But I do, you know, I think the whole key to the Orioles taking the next step, they developed around position players. Grayson Rodriguez, I think, is going to be really good. I'm not sure if D.L. Hall's a starter or he's a reliever yet. He has a lot of reliever tendencies in his delivery and his approach to his craft. And so can the young pitching that got over the hump this year, was that sustainable? 
and what they're seeing. Can they do that again next year? And so, you know, that's the beauty of there's no perfect teams in our game. Um, so I think the Mariners are poised to become potentially that, um, especially if they could hold on to Hanniger as the veteran guy on that team. And, you know, in the National League, I think the Mets are going to turn into a real beast um, because I think they've got a really smart owner that gets it. And, um, you know, um, I think you should watch the Diamondbacks. They've got great. Yeah. I think Mike Hazen is one of the best GMs in the game. And what Mike Hazen went through this year with the loss of his, his wife um, through their terrible cancer mm. and raising three boys and still leading that organization through the transition they made this year tells you everything you want to know about the character of Mike and incredible leader, leader he is. But, I mean, look at an outfield now. Like, like the McCarthy kids getting over the hump. Alex Thomas is – an elite athlete, Corbin's an elite athlete, Marte has got a chance to, you know, I think take more steps forward next year. Walker's just turned into this monster in the middle of the lineup. They're solid behind the plate. The Rojas kid at third base is, I think, turning into something. I mean, I look at that team right now and go, darn, like they're a shortstop away from me from being this this really, really good team. And so if they've got the ability to fish on one of these shortstops, you know, I think they're really close to being a really good team. Bring back Dansby Swanson after all these years. True. Rectify a, a bad deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like what they're doing. Is there any other teams that you kind of like in terms of subtly? They might not, it might not be showing up right now in terms of the record, but you like the path they're on moving forward. You know, I know the Red Sox are getting destroyed this year from the media standpoint, but I really do understand what Hyam's trying to get to. It's just stinks trying to get there where he's got this Cassis and York and Marcelo, you know, he's got this wave of great looking younger talent coming on. And he knows that if he can try to figure out how to stay competitive until that young talent hits, then he can put the model in place that he truly believes in. But his pressure in a larger market with high expectations to do that is just so much harder than doing it in a smaller market with little to no expectations going through a rebuild. And, but I do, I do understand where he's trying to get to. And I, I think their scouting director, um, Mike is one of the better ones in the game. Um, so I do, I do, do understand. I, and I do like their long-term future. I just, the short term of where they're at just stinks right now. How about the Cincinnati Reds? What do you think of the Reds? You know, I like what Nick and the group have done there. Um, I think Lodolo is turning into an impact starter. Yes. Yeah. I think Green has a chance to be that. He really still needs to learn the art of pitching, but I do think he'll learn from that. And I, I think they've made – they've got – you know, to me, their young catcher who's gotten hurt is one of the best in the game. So, foundationally, they got three young shortstops. I don't think the guy they've got playing shortstop, Ferrario, will end up – he's going to end up being a super utility player for him because they've got better guys coming in down the road. So, I do I, I do like what the Reds are doing, and I, I do think in that division – where you've got some teetering and tottering, they, uh, they've got a chance to be really good. I don't think they're that far away from being good. I agree. I like what they've done too. I think they've been, they, they were in a situation where they sort of had to do what they did. And some teams might just kind of not want to make that move, but I like that they did it. They reloaded. And one of my friends who's a Reds fan was, he's been telling me this whole time, the same thing that you say, it's not about one singular season. It's about sustaining success over a long period of time. And you know, Dan, what do you think about when people use the term tanking in baseball? Because my thought has always been, generally, a lot of these teams aren't trying to lose games. You might feel differently. But what it appears to me is like, OK, we're trying to rebuild our farm system and we're going to maximize on the players at the big league level as best we can. Now, as a result, we're probably not going to win as many games. But we're building up our farm system. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, it's been going on for years, Jack. Um... I think the term tanking became more nouveau because so many teams were copying the same model. So like in Cleveland, we bought our payroll in the, in the late eighties, early, really early nineties. I mean, we were down like seven, $8 million. It was bizarre. I mean, the, way different seven, yeah. eight million back then maybe constitute kind of where the Orioles were at at the start of the year in the thirties. Um, and where Cleveland is, you know, now. So, I think it's because every team approached the same model. 
that it became bad for our game. I think it became bad when front offices were more concerned about future wins than current wins. And so I think everything in the game has to be done balanced. And I think it became problematic when really, if you looked at half the industry, you can honestly make an argument they weren't trying to win. And I think that's where the big disconnect is between front offices and players and people in uniform is that intellectually, I get it, where front offices are are thinking that, I mean, I'm not going to worry about marginal wins when I'm trying to figure out how to create big gaps of wins. Yet anybody that's ever worn a uniform just does not think that way. Anybody that's worn a uniform every single night, they're trying to win a game. They're trying to perform well for themselves, but they're trying to win that game that night. And I think that's yeah. that created this big disconnect within our game, which has festered, I think, in the relationship between the two entities that run our game. And, um, you know, I think there's always going to be teams that rebuild. I think you have to have a model, which I think they've done a great job putting in place. You just can't have it to where you're trying to sustain that rebuilding model for three or four years where you're going to lose 100 games in a row for three or four years. Then I don't think you should be rewarded doing that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, We talked about some of these teams that we like who are doing it that way. Um, Some teams who might be making like the Brewers have never. The Brewers have never tanked. The Oakland A's up to this year, Billy and David yeah. had never gone down that path. They had no choice now. You know the last the time the A's lost 100 games in a season? Had to be a long time ago. 1979. Yeah, they never have gone through. So there are clubs in the game that thread the needle exceptionally well. You don't have to go through a complete rebuild um, to be able to do that. But though I, but that, But I do get why clubs in certain markets have to do that too. Um, but I, I do think there is paths that you can stay competitive and uh, kind of catch your breath a little bit, but not completely go in the tank and try to, you know, get as high a draft pick. It's not the draft pick, it's the pool money clubs are after, trying to have as much buying power within the draft each and every year, both domestically and internationally. So we've seen a very different approach from a non-big market team recently with the San Diego Padres where they have been trading, making these big free agent signings. I remember on the deadline day watching you on there and the other guys at the table were so excited about this, watching Juan Soto in this lineup with Tatis, who's now not going to be, well, we won't see him until midway through next year. And uh, a number of those other stars, Machado, Josh Bell. And you were talking about how, you know what, uh, I would – kind of you know lower expectations a little bit this is they're in a spot now where they're not going they've taken a lot out of their farm system now i don't want to misquote you or anything like that but you were hesitant to crown them right away and since then 13 and 13 since the trade deadline they've been a 500 team they have a two and a half game lead in the last wild card spot in the national league Uh, what's your take on what the padres are doing and why do you think they're not um, coming out of the gate as strong as they, a lot of people thought they would be. Yeah, well, I mean, to be clear, I mean, I do have tremendous respect for the courage that A.J. Preller showed. Um, just not many people have the courage <laughs> to pull off that kind of deal because A.J.'s a really bright guy. He understands yeah. the position that puts the franchise in. A good tremendous courage to their Peter Seidler and their ownership group, you know, making that kind of commitment to try to, you know, be all in to win. It's just the game of baseball itself is a funny game, Jack. And just when you think things should play out one way, they don't play out that way just because it's the nature of the game. In defense of what happened there, I thought that the Tatis announcement completely blew up the, the rhythm and the momentum that they had going after the trading deadline. I, it was probably not anticipated. It couldn't have been anticipated. And I think it just totally – rocked the foundation of the franchise and it became a huge distraction. Whereas everything was going in the right direction, it became a distraction that the players and the staff and the front office now had to address. Um, And now I think they're just trying to find their way back right now. The Josh Hader trade, anytime bullpens for me are the most mercurial role, uh, role to trade for in the game. You just never know, you know, I had more success in acquiring guys 
uh, Rafi Bedencourt, Joe Bimel, the Troy Hawkins at the trading deadline that weren't having good years <laughs> that had shown that they were good in the past because it's just the way relievers are. And um, Josh has gone through a lot of personal stuff this year. And I don't think people realize, you know, he went through his wife uh, was pregnant. There was a, you know, like pregnancies have ups and downs with them. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure he was distracted. I mean, it's hard. You, you don't just turn on a light switch when you show up at the ballpark and leave all your personal challenges at home. They're human beings. They're not robots. And so then getting traded all the way out to the West Coast when he wasn't pitching real well at the time to begin with, thrown into a situation where the pressure and expectations were enormous, dealing with a ton of personal stuff that he still didn't, you know, still trying to wrestle with. It was He was just set up to not do well right away. It doesn't mean he won't figure out, like, he had a good outing last night. It yep. doesn't mean he doesn't get on a roll. It's just, just the nature of our game. So that's where trades for me, when you're trying to recreate your club at the trading deadline, it's a really dangerous thing to do. It usually, for me, doesn't work. But in defense of those guys, it might have worked here because the talent they were getting back was enormous, just in Soto alone. But I think that the Tease thing really rocked their momentum. Yeah, uh, that really was – strange the whole everything with tatis over the past year or two has been strange to say yeah just things. emotional people grow up at different times in their life um hopefully through this challenges i mean we all do i mean i showed at his age tremendous emotional immaturity people could argue i've shown emotional immaturity into my 40s um because <laughs> the game would uh, you know i would emotionally react react to the game not in the best ways all the time and so hopefully through this he just grows up and understands that this is a privilege of what he gets to do and, uh, you know, he approaches it with a, you know, a longing to, you know, he's got the talent to be one of the best players in the game, but you got to have the discipline along with the talent to be that. So today is September 1st. The rosters expand from 26 to 28 active roster. Uh, a couple years ago, it switched. We used to have the 40 man rosters for the month of September. Did you like that model better or do you like this current model better? I think the current model is better for the game, but I like the, the bigger rosters because when you're in a smaller or mid-sized market and you do, do a good job in the acquisition of talent, um, some of the ways that you compete with clubs that have the larger wherewithal of payroll is you can throw more bodies uh, at them that are good. And, um, you know, so I do think they've limited, like I wish it could have gone to at least 30 rather than 28, just so your ability to add players from your system in Colorado. I mean, it, we, we would try to hold on to September because of the pitching physical problems that created with both our pitching and position players, just so we can start to give guys some blow. And so uh, I was not a proponent of shrinking the rosters when I ran a team uh, in the market that I was in, because it was one of the huge competitive advantages we had if we did a good job, you know, in scouting and development. The, thing I I, pre, oh, sorry. the industry, it's good. <clears throat> the thing I liked about the 40 man rosters is there are so many guys who that's their one shining moment, or maybe they get a couple shining moments. They're only going to get that opportunity. That's it. They're going to spend 10 years in the minor leagues. They're going to get that one call up. And it's so meaningful. Yeah, I agree. Great for yeah, them. I agree yeah, I'm not fired up at all about shrinking the development system. I mean, I get you know, the percentage of kids that come from X round of the draft on and how many teams, you know, you really need to develop players. But I never looked at it that way. I always felt like if you had a minor league team and you ended up getting two guys that provided in their career, there were one war players. It was worth the entire team. Um, and so I don't like that there's less entry points into our game for players that are passionate about it. I think it hurts our game overall. And I think it hurts the interest in our game. And I'm not fired up that you have less entry points for guys to get to the big leagues too. Yeah, and I think the other thing that I would say, again, from my outsider perspective, is I would think that having some of those guys who are the career minor leaguers, the Crash Davises, if you will, they're going to spend 10 years in the minor leagues. But they're getting, so there are probably a lot of guys like that who are good mentors to those prospects. No doubt. And no doubt, it's, Jack. It, if you – are not going to have as many entry points, then we're going to phase out more of those players from the game when I think those guys are good for our game. Yeah, and I'm hoping maybe expansion makes up for that. You know, if we add two more teams, yeah. you know, we're creating way more jobs for players. 
And so my hope is that, uh, you know, that we create more entry points based upon the expansion of the game, because I do think there's markets, including the one I'm, I live in now, that would be great to have a major league team. Yeah, if you could pick the next two expansion uh, markets, what would you choose? Well, I think Nashville proximity yeah. wise would be incredible as long as, you know, some of the markets that surround them, you know, the Atlanta market and St. Louis don't have a heart attack. Um, <laughs> I just feel like it's a drivable city uh, for so many states to come to. And I think it's just a wonderful destination city. And I think it would do phenomenally well here. I think Charlotte would do well. I think Vegas yeah. would do exceptionally well. Um, I think Austin, Texas would do great as an expansion market because i think the city is just booming right now so i think there's really viable markets um you know within our country that would do great with major league baseball we also are now going to have uh a change to our schedule where every team is going to play each other yeah i'm a proponent of that you like it i mean i do uh you know i realize people that are more interdivision people don't but um division strengths change year in and year out and so I think there's – unless you were going to reseed postseason teams, having a balanced schedule is a much fairer representation of the, of the competitiveness of each individual team. I think the downside – and I do agree with that, but I wish there was a way that – so, for instance, the Cubs and Cardinals play each other six times as it is right now. And every time those teams play each other, or if it's the Yankees and the Red Sox or the Dodgers and the Giants last year, like those games are appointment viewing. And I would rather see now we're going to have four series between those teams. I would. I think rather... it's 13 games, right, rather than 19 games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. So two I less series. You're... Yeah, but, you know, you, that means you're also going to see the Mets coming in, who could be a juggernaut, or the Braves more. I mean, you're going to see a lot more teams coming in than the previous schedule dictates. And my counterargument pushback is, is I'm not sure that you're going to – not be excited about seeing Pittsburgh come in for as many dates or, you know, some of the other teams within your division that may not be the Cardinals. And so I think there's a give and take. And I, yeah. I think the one thing with scheduling, it's you're never going to have a perfect schedule ever. Right. It's just there, there, there's, there's no model yeah. that exists to have that. I mean, yeah, because you can't have the Cubs and Cardinals play each other six times and they play everyone else in the division four times. You I can't. Well, you could, but. You could. Maybe eventually they'll figure that model out. But I do like a balanced schedule. I just feel like it creates a true representation of the competitiveness of each and every team. Dan, earlier this week, there was some news that broke and we could have minor league players becoming represented and unionizing, being, coming, being represented by the MLBPA. For those who might not understand what this means, what would this, how would this change our sport? You know, Jack, I don't, you know, honestly, I don't really know the answer to that yet because I'm not sure um, of the parameters that surround that. I don't know what the motive is behind trying to unionize the players. I mean, certainly if it's to get them better um, working conditions, I'm all for that. I mean, anything that's going to help minor league players make a better living wage and being able to play our game and afford to live. But if it creates less entry points for players, if it means shrinking more yeah. of the game, I'm not for that either. Yeah. And so I don't, I really haven't studied it enough or I haven't seen enough information come across, you know, my desk anyway, to where I'm privy to, to what all this means to be able to talk about it in an intelligent way. So I'm sorry, but I just don't have enough data points to be able to talk about it intelligently enough to, you know, to provide any great input. That's a great answer. I like it when people say, you know what? I don't know. That's fine. Not try to say something not knowing. Yeah, no, I don't really worry ever about being the smartest person in the room because I know I'm not. And so I don't ever want to talk about something that I'm not versed in. Um, because I don't feel like it's a fair representation for the parties that are involved doing it. You know, once I have more information about it and I study it more and, you know, I pray about a little bit of what all this means and I'm more than happy to have an opinion on it. But prior to that, I try not to have opinions on things I don't know enough about. 
Very fair. I think the one concern, like you said, we don't know what this thing is going to mean. And you kind of hinted at it. I think some people are concerned that if you increase the minimum wage of the minor league players, are there less minor league players that they're able to pay? And now are you slashing the farm system even further because they got rid of some affiliates a couple years ago, which I really, I, I wish that hadn't happened. I think, I think again, I agree with you, Jay. Yeah. I agree with you that very much. And that would be, that would be a huge concern for me. Um, you know, about, uh, you know, if, if the byproduct unizing was, that was an end result, then I wouldn't be in favor of that. It's can you explain to people why our game is better with more minor league teams than less? Well, um, I think it's proven that um, you're a lifelong fan if you've ever played the game. So you're a lifelong fan if you've been exposed to the game. In person exposed to the game, not through a streaming device, but an actual in person experience where there is an emotional connection between you and whatever product that is, whether it's a high school game, a college game team that you follow or a minor league team. And so when you shrink that, you're creating less opportunities for people to become emotionally attached to our game. So I thought it was a very short, I understand the business, I understand the business reasons for doing it. But I thought it was a very short-sighted view of the long-term value of having teams in all of those markets where fans are becoming emotionally attached to that particular team. And then eventually the players that come through there. Second thing is I'm a huge proponent that, you know, predicting talent is not a black and white area. There's more shades of gray. And the more opportunities you give the players to play, the more opportunity you're going you're gonna to create big league players out of those opportunities. And so I, I've seen it happen too many times in my career. So I'm sad that there's less opportunities for players to be given those opportunities. Yeah. And it also seemed like there were a lot of teams or at least some teams that now they had too many position players. Like they had a lot of really good skilled position players. And now with less minor league teams and levels, it's harder to get all those guys the right amount of playing time in their current farm system. Agree completely. Yeah, there's nothing that substitute live games. Um, nothing at all. Even the company that I own, WinReality, which replicates live game at backs, still does not replicate games. I mean, nothing out there replicates the pressure of games and the physical wear and tear of games and having to show up not feeling right and still going out to compete and learning the discipline of getting to bed on time, eating right, all the things that go into making a great big league player. So I think our game lost something having less minor league teams to do that. Dan, do you have a particular trade or free agent signing from when you ran a club that you are most proud of? Um, you know, I think the one, tra you know, that'd be hard, Jack. I was, well, I have one in mind for you. Well, I mean, I, I, I was going to say the DJ LeMay <laughs> yeah. trade for me probably is the one that I take great personal satisfaction in because not anybody on my team of people wanted me to do it. Oh, wow. Uh, so, but we did it anyway. And I just have tremendous respect for everything that represents that DJ represents, you know, within our game. Um, you know, I wouldn't say one of my strengths was free agent signings. You know, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't do it often. And I probably had more swings and misses in that endeavor than I did in scouting and development and trades. Um, so it was always part of me that was uncomfortable doing it. So I can imagine that God put that on my heart that I wasn't real good at doing it. <laughs> and so I don't any, you know, I'm sure there are some free agents that turned out exceptionally well for me, but uh, the reality of it is I didn't do that very often. The Ian, Ian Stewart, DJ LeMahieu trade for those who are listening, who aren't aware, December 8th, 2011, the Cubs, which was, this is when Theo first came in traded LeMahieu and Tyler Colvin for Casey Weathers and Ian Stewart. And Ian Stewart ended up being a guy that they ended up DFAing. He didn't perform well with the Cubs. 
And uh, that's one that my dad has over the years just been like, ah, we could have had DJ LeMayhew. And he said, he's like, ask Dan today. He's like, ask him if he regrets trading for DJ LeMayhew. <laughs> well, in defense of the Cubs, Ian Stewart talent level was uh, phenomenal. And he just, you know, that I could see where he just got stuck behind Garrett Adkins. We had Jeff Baker. You know, it was like he was never really given this ramp. To, so, I, I, you know, if I'm Theo and Jed, I get it. I mean, I get going. Yeah, well, DJ's skill set is this, but if we hit on this guy and the rebuild that we're going, we got a superstar. And so I get it. <laughs> and I definitely feel like Ian needed to change the scenery from, from Colorado to have any chance to succeed in his career. And, uh, again, again, we didn't have a ton of internal people. In fact, we had none uh, at that winter meetings that in our scouting room, our major league scouts, our analytical group, our whole, no, no one wanted to acquire DJ except me. And, uh, and uh, we did it. And Jim Hendry helped me with that deal, too. Jimmy was the former uh, GM of the Cubs, no longer employed by him, and somebody that I think very highly of, and I really trusted his baseball acumen. And so I called him up. He didn't have to give me any information. Um, I think he was still working for – maybe he was with the Yankees at the time or he was in between jobs. I don't re really recall. And uh, he just said, Dan, if you got a chance to get DJ with me, you ought to do so because the guy's going to flat out hit, but he's also going to – he's everything you'd want, and he's just scratching the surface how good he can be. And I really trusted Jimmy's judgment. So he was the only one that had g given me any affirmation it was the right deal to do on, on my end of it. And he wasn't even working for us. Wow. I, that's quite a story. I did not know that. Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Good. Go ahead. Uh, it's okay, Jack. Yeah, it was a good story. Yeah. But, you know, again, <laughs> I had, to, I've had a ton of misses, no trades too. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're hitting 50, 50 in free agent trade signings, you're going to the hall of fame. How did you see working in a, a major league baseball front office change over the 15 years from when you started to when it, or I guess, I mean, you could even go back even earlier to when you were the assistant GM. How'd you see it change over your years in front office? Uh, unfortunately for me, Jack, it became less about the people and more about the numbers. And I still feel the most um, impactful tool in our game is the people that you employ and the most impactful thing that they you can provide for them are meaningful, authentic relationships. So the thought process of creativity, which is the greatest gift every human being has, could flourish in an environment um, and culture that was healthy. And I feel like the more you regulate the game to analytical numbers, the more you move away from how impactful those relationships and cultures are. And, um, you know, hopefully at some point in time, it's a game that navigates its, its way back to that at that juncture, because I think we're just a healthy industry if that's in place. Dan, I want to transition to talking about some non-baseball stuff. Um, something I'm really curious to know about, because we've spoken about our, we both share a, a faith in Jesus Christ and a relationship right. with him. And I'd love to just know your story. Did you grow up in church? Did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I grew up in Catholicism, um, strict Roman Catholic family. But it wasn't until I, you know, I understood what being a Christian was because it's, but I really didn't get it. Um, I would say that like most people, I think when you go through, a, God takes you through a reshaping your life. Going to Colorado was an extremely humbling experience for me because um, everything I, I thought I was good at, you know, turned out maybe I wasn't as good as what I thought I was. But it was also meeting Kelly McGregor who, um, I think there are certain people God puts in your life that are, you know, your game changers. And the late Kelly McGregor, you know, really opened my mind up to what being a Christian man was all about and really had to do an autopsy in my own life to realize I was the furthest thing probably from, from that. Hmm. And, um, you know, so if, for whatever lack of success, I may have had a Colorado on the field and, you know, you can argue that one way or the other, however position you want to take. <laughs> Uh, I know why God brought me to Colorado, which was he needed me to, one, he needed to reshape me in the most humbling of ways. But number two, he wanted me to get introduced to a man who really stood for what being a Christian was all about. So hopefully that experience, I became a better husband, a better father, a better leader, um, you know, than I was prior to going there. But you know what, Jack, I, I really feel everybody's Christian's journey is just so unique to them. 
and every day it's a battle. Like you got to put your armor on, on on a daily basis and, you know, fight the battle. And being a Christian, I would say, is 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 impossible without Christ involved right. in, the, in the process. And every day for me is 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 if I don't invite him into my life and totally surrender that, then it's a day that I'm probably not living any of the examples of what being a Christian man's all about. So it's, it's a daily struggle for me. I'm sure it might be easier for other people, but for me, <laughs> it's impossible left up to me alone. It's really interesting that you mentioned how the late Kelly McGregor impacted you, because I think that is important for people to hear how one how much one person an interaction with one person and how they embody christ can change their life yeah and uh you know clint hurdle did the same thing for me because uh clint gave me the gift of grace even with the incredible painful decision of not keeping him in the role that he is he showed the grace he showed me was only a christian man could do that and his influence on me shaped me to understand that uh, chasing wins and championships, though incredibly rewarding and important, I mean, you know, it's not even close to being as important as the type of person you are and the difference you should make in each person's life that you touch. And it only makes it so much more rewarding if you have a group of people that share those kind of values and they're trying to accomplish the same thing. Is there anything in particular in terms of something that those men had said to you at one point in time or action or two that really made this thing click for you that you're like, this is the way that I got to live? No, unfortunately, I was not the quickest learner. <laughs> and so it was uh, slow and steady. You know, that constant reshaping, uh, constant humbling constant understanding that uh, we're foolish to think that we have that much control over the things that happen to us in life. The only thing we had control over is how we react to the things that happen to us in life. And so this was when you were in your forties or so? Oh yeah. Late forties. It took me a lot. As I said, it's really, really took me a long time. You know, I could say I was a Christian before that, but you know, God would chuckle at that statement. <laughs> Christ would be, he, he, cause he knew better and you can't fool, you can't fool Christ. I would say it's in my late forties until I really got it. And so, but it wasn't one light bulb. I wish right. it was uh, a lightning strike that got me to understand it. It was more of just this slow understanding. I hired a guy named Bode Mitchell. He became um, kind of our, uh, you know, heart meter of our organization and um he was our minister on sundays for our players and he was an individual in our office that really helped me understand um how to be more christ-like in my own life day in and day out and gave me examples and practices um and he gave me some hard um, evaluations too when he rewarded it and i think everybody needs those kind of people in their lives and Bo kind of replaced Kelly for me when Kelly passed away. He kind of picked up the torch, God handed it to him and continued to reshape me. And I think the thing that I miss most about running a team um, is that being part of a group of those kind of people and having those kind of authentic relationships and being able to share that in a way that uh, you felt like you were making a difference day in and day out. And I really do miss that part of it a lot. Hmm. Is there a way that we could do something like that now that you're not in the uh, in the front office, is there a way that you can embody that in another role? You know, again, that's I kind of leave that up to to Christ to open that door and to provide direction to me. I'm 62, turning 63 here next week. Um, I don't feel like I'm old, um, so you're I feel not. like I've got. I feel like I got a lot left. It's just a matter of you know how he wants to use that. My dad turned 64 this year. Yeah. So you guys are around the same age. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm just getting started in a lot of ways because yeah. I've things have slowed down for me now. Where I think things didn't weren't slower when I was younger. They're a lot slower for me now. I see things more clearly than I did when I was younger. How has your life changed since encountering Jesus? Uh, I've realized I'm a part of something way bigger than myself. Complete understanding that everything that's happened to me in my life has happened for a reason. Every good thing that's happened for me is, is because of him. 
And every time I've strayed, it's because of me. And that uh, life is a lot easier when you believe in something way bigger than yourself. Something you also mentioned was how there wasn't kind of like one clear defining moment. And I think that's very true for pretty much everybody because I like to think of it as a relationship that you have. And in any relationship, you have different milestones. You have a how we met story. You have, a, you know, in a, in a dating relationship, an engagement, a marriage, and there's so many ways that you grow closer. You know, over the years. I think there are issues. I think there are examples that it is a lightning bolt, and I'm envious. Of yeah, that, honestly, I mean, I really wish that had happened to me, um, but it didn't. And so, I do think you're right, Jack. I don't think faith is anything more than a relationship. And you know, whether you're a believer or not believer, I just hope everybody believes in something bigger than themselves, because this world's hard, and um, going through it without believing in something bigger than yourself, I can't imagine how challenging that would be. Yeah. That's a big part of big part of my story. I've hit plenty of struggles over the years and sure. to have God guiding me through it and now bringing me to my new role, my new job and making connections with people like you, Dan, uh, I've been able to see just how blessed I am and how God has had his hand on my life. Yeah, I do. I think it's important each day that we all have an attitude of gratitude for what we have. But again, it's hard. I mean, I'm <laughs> not, you know, people listen to people talk like this and they go, well, I mean, that might be easy for you, but it, none of this is easy. No. And it's a constant battle. And I lose more than I win without a shadow of a doubt. I'm more on the failing column than I am on the success column. But, I, you know, I think there's like Adam one and Adam two. And Adam one is is the individual that I was, which was totally consumed with, um, you know, I want the next challenge. I want to win that challenge. I want to be known for winning that challenge. I want this material benefit. I want that material benefit out of that. I want to be paid X. I want to be paid Y. And as soon as you get those things, you need them again, because that's what Adam one is represented. That's the, that's the challenge of him. That's like a life that has no fulfillment at all. And Adam, too, wants, is competitive in the same way. But he realizes the biggest challenge is the ones that lie within him. And the, the key to self-actualization is that constant battle on a daily basis of their, your own demons and how you can conquer those to become a better person for the person that you're connected to in that given day, whatever that may be, a serious relationship or a casual one. And so that's the, that's the battle I'm in on a daily basis. You know, I was trying to win that battle and I'm telling you, you can't win it without Christ in your heart. No, you cannot. You need Christ in order to transform your mind and your heart. And you got to pray all day long. It's not yeah. just, it's a constant conversation that you have all day long. So I walk around, I look like I'm talking to myself, <laughs> you know, but I'm really not, I'm not cracking up. I'm actually having a conversation. I'm trying to get better at, having a constant conversation about every single topic that comes up in my life mm. because in some way, shape or form, that topic has been put in my life by God. Now I got to figure out what he wants me to do with it. Amen. So I yeah. appreciate you asking that Jack. I really do. Absolutely. I think the thing is, the other thing is it's so easy for us to, when God answers our prayers to then just be so to turn away from God and look and be like, Oh, look at all this awesome stuff I have now. I don't need yeah. God. Yeah, I think that's just emotional maturity when you realize that everything you have, you're just, it's just on loan from God. He just gets you're, you're the temporary holder of whatever you've got. And uh, there's nothing that from a material standpoint is ever going to be fulfilling in any way, shape or form, unless it's tied to that you're doing it for a purpose beyond yourself. Yeah, because there's always going to be we find ourselves sometimes thinking, well, if I get this next job or this next whatever Correct. it is, house, car, relationship, whatever it is, and then it doesn't satisfy you, then you're on to what's the next thing? I want this next yeah. thing, and then I'll be satisfied. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, truly. And I think that's where sports can get a little out of control on you because you you feel like winning is that um, that's it. You get to that point, and you go to a World Series, and whether you win or lose, you feel like, okay. And then you wake up the next day and go, well, really, that wasn't everything I thought it was going to be, and now i got to do it all over again. And so I do think you're, I think you can be as competitive an individual and tough and mentally strong 
Um, I just you think you have to realize that you've got to have a bigger purpose in your life to make that all seem worthwhile for yourself and anybody that's connected with you along the journey. Hmm. Amen. It took me a long time to figure that out, Jack. Long time? <laughs> took a long time. And then God took it away and said, now, you know, I'm not going to let you do this anymore. I want you to do something else. And I'm still in that that transition stage. Dan, you had told me something the first time we spoke on the phone that um, I just thought was it really it had a profound impact on me. And you said that in order to uh, you had said something to the effect of you wanted to serve God with your life. And by being in a major league front office or a job or whatever it is, it can be easy for that to become your God. And I thought that was just so poignant and again i don't want to misquote you or misrepresent you so correct me if i said anything no you can't you only can have one god in your life you can't serve two masters that's biblical and i believe what's in the bible and that's both in the old testament and in the new testament and so whichever side of the book page you're going to turn to it's it's pretty evident that's one of his core principles you can't serve two masters and you can be the point that people don't realize you can be exceptional at what you do from a worldly perspective, it still only served one master. It just took me a long time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. The harder I chased that, the more elusive it became. When I gave up trying to chase it, it started to find me. I just think everybody's path is different. Yeah. So I, I had a hardened heart that needed to be softened for that to take place. But it's true. I do believe that. And just speaking of prayer, like we talk about how easy it is to have that prayer request answered and then to like what i'm saying is thank god when he answers your prayers thank him all the time for everything he's given you because even when it you don't feel even when you're going through the hardest time of your life god is blessing you and giving you certain that's the hard things. part jack yeah the hard part is it, it it doesn't make any sense to thank god when you're going through a really challenging moment in your life it just doesn't, it's not logical. Like, why would anybody do that? I mean, you look what's happened to you. But the reality of it is, is you have to thank them, even in the more challenging parts, because you got to believe that there's a reason for all that. And you'll know at some point in time, or he'll maybe not know, but he'll get you to a point where he's more worried about the person you're becoming than what you're accomplishing. So he's shaping your character in ways through those moments that are a blessing. It's just hard. None of this is easy. That's what I said. Being a Christian is impossible. Amen. Do you have a favorite Bible verse or a passage that's spoken to you recently? Uh, you know, I keep what I call here is my little my little black book. And I keep my Bible verses that I refer to on a daily basis um, in the back. And, um, you know, so um, i got to put on my... <laughs> Every day is a different one for me. So I've got a grouping of them. Um, so, you know, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in his honor. Mm. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you more than anything. Mm. And I mean, I can go on and on and on with all of my verses. You know, truly believe Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing but everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. I could go on and on here. I just think it's important that you don't pick out one that's important, that you yeah. pick out um, as many as you can. And each and every day, just refer to them when you're going through moments. You know, when, if I could say read anything, read Proverbs, because I think Proverbs mm. is a guidepost for life. And understanding Proverbs and really how it applies to your life kind of gives you a, a map for how you should live your life. Yeah. Read the Bible. If you're listening to this podcast, let's read the Bible. You came for the baseball, stayed for the Bible talk. Dan, thank you so much for coming on today. This was Jack, amazing. Thanks for having me, buddy. I enjoyed, I enjoy everything you do and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. All right, y'all. That concludes today's podcast episode with Dan O'Dowd from the Colorado Rockies. Cleveland Indians. He was their assistant GM. He was a Rockies GM for 15 years. And now he's an analyst on MLB Network. Does a great job. Was awesome to cover a wide variety of topics with him today. And hopefully we'll have him on again sometime down the road, talk some more ball. Um, 
If you guys enjoy today's episode, make sure you subscribe to the Jack Vita Show here on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast, please hit subscribe. We're going to have some more great guests coming on soon. Uh, I think next up, I'm going to be speaking with Brittany Baldy, who does a lot with independent league baseball. And she was also on a couple of reality shows. She was on Are You the One on MTV, and she was on The Challenge on MTV as well. But now she's involved with independent league. And independent league baseball, the Atlantic League, has been at the forefront of a lot of changes of what we are starting to see at the major league level. They were the first to implement a pitch clock to have this intentional walk rule where you don't throw any pitches. Um, really, if you look at any of the new things that Major League Baseball has done, it's come from Independent League Baseball, and they're trying stuff out right now that I think will be really interesting to discuss and how that could potentially impact the game moving forward. We'll also just talk about life, talk about our time on reality TV, uh, talk about her, uh, she's a major, or she's a wag, her uh, fiance plays independent league, but also played in the majors uh, a couple years ago. So it's going to be a great episode. I hope you guys will join us. Make sure you subscribe to the Jack Vita show. And until then, I'm Jack Vita, bringing the dancing lobsters.